This is Walter Kern. And this oh. is Mike Mills. <laughs> and he wrote Thumbsucker, and I brutally demolished it in the process of adapting it. He could do no else. I mean, <laughs> it was ripe for being demolished. Uh, <laughs> took place over years, uh, which you can't do without having to change somebody's voice and costume every five minutes, I suppose. <laughs> I, I was thrilled with the adaptation and Thank you. never expected I would be. <laughs> well, you're, yeah, well, we'll talk more about how uh, generous you were with me. Um, but I thought maybe we'd start with, I did, I've done so many interviews, so everybody asked me, like, why did you like the book? Or what, you know, attracted you to the book? I get asked that, you know, thousands of times. And the uh, answer that I kept coming to was, you know, it's very funny, and I thought it was very real, and I thought it was very um, unformulaic, you know what I mean? And I liked all the, all the details seemed so like, God, that had to have happened, and, or, you know, there's something so tangible about it and, and sort of odd in the best way, in like a very human way. And, but then as soon as I started adapting, I realized the much deeper underlying thing where I so identified with Justin, and especially the relationship with the mom. And some of the things he said about the mom were so like, whoop, whoop, went, you know, like a spear in my chest. Name one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read you some. Okay. Um, but it became, quickly bef for me, it's like I had this whole transference thing where I was like, I was just reliving my relationship with my mom. And it was, um, I think that was the thing that really electrified me and like made me stick with it through all the like tough times that were mm -hmm. to come with trying to get it. Well, there's the scenes where you described how beautiful she was mm -hmm. and, and, and that she was sort of outside the family, that mm -hmm. the guys in the family weren't good enough for her. And while I didn't have that relationship with like beauty per se, mm -hmm. the, I had a relationship with a certain kind of charisma mm -hmm. that seemed like out of bounds or un, other than the rest of the family. Right. Um, you say, um, I found it hard to look Audrey in the eye during these late night chats in my bedroom. I couldn't stand her beauty. It made me fidget. To have such a good looking woman for a mother didn't seem fair to me. It raised expectations for my future love life that I feared would never be fulfilled. When Audrey was my age, I felt she wouldn't have noticed me. The only way someone like me could hold the gaze of someone like her was to be her child, her son. And then I love this part. You'll always be my baby, sometimes, she sometimes said rising from my bed after our talks, and nothing made me matter. I felt cheated. Unlike Mike and the other young men she'd known who had the chance to make winning first impressions, I met her when I was helpless, speechless, tiny. Um, I love the grandiosity of that in, in, little, in little Justin, you know what I mean? So needing to be her peer, her suitor, her, her every man, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And it's so hugely ambitious for mm -hmm. a kid. And also terribly tragic, like when the kid dumps their kidness and tries to become the adult to the to the mom, you know what I mean? And that was the part that I was like, could so grab onto. Well, you know, I, this is in a large degree an autobiographical novel. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember it, when I was a kid, my mother actually entering a contest like the one in the movie and the book to win a date with a famous person. In this in, in reality, it was Joe Namath. Uh -huh. And I immediately felt in competition with him. Uh -huh. A pro quarterback, Broadway <laughs> Joe. And, and uh, how old were you? Oh, seven, <laughs> eight, maybe nine. Uh, no, I think I was a little bit older than that. But, uh -huh. but you know, I, I had that same experience. My, my mother, for whatever reason, it seemed to be of a cut above or a class apart or uh -huh. to have some magic that the rest of us didn't have. And, uh, and it was that intrusion from the outside world of a male figure uh, from, from, from the media, sort of, that, that made me aware that in some sense we were in competition for her, for her uh, love or attention. And uh, at least I felt that way. It's kind of a sick thought for a kid to right, have. Right, right, right. But I, I think it's really beautiful. You know what I mean? I think it's so, it's so, like, uh, like this film. I think it's true, and often it describes as being like about small things. Mm -hmm. You know, about little details and minutia of relationships. But if you think about that posture or that dream or that desire to to compete with Joe Namath, to to keep mom, all that, it's huge. Right. You know, that's like epic scale. Right. And, and at the, but at the same time, it was not a one-way street. I think that my mother, in some sense, uh, and, and, and I 
think this played beautifully in the movie in the in the dressing room scene uh -huh. in particular wanted that affirmation from me right right and so the fact that i couldn't quite provide it was both frustrating, embarrassing, right. and yet uh, created a desire right, to right. be something more than I was, a little kid. Right, and it was heightened by the fact that she kind of let you in and, and led you to the pedestal. Yeah, exactly. You couldn't quite climb up exactly. on it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So all that, I, can, I think I, I think that to me, and at least in my interpretation of the book, that's like the underlying glue or mm -hmm. the underlining accelerant right. <laughs> through the whole thing. It's like the hottest button of the whole right. thing. Right. And I think I kind of zeroed everything around that, you know, and also right. because I could relate to it to the most. Well, I mean, it is. I mean, this is a story about, I guess, what the psychologists call self-comfort, the uh -huh. ability to, to sort of sustain and nurture yourself in the face of uh, chaotic or painful reality and uh, that reality commences with this separation from your mother right, and, right, and, right. Uh, and it resolves itself when you're able to reunite with yourself right um, and, and to me that is the arc of the story if we're right. going to use those terms right 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 you know it's funny um, uh, when I was trying to get financing of this film, I ran into a lot of problems and a lot of resistance. I can't imagine. <laughs> a lot of when I was trying to get it published, I ran into a lot of problems <laughs> and resistance. And, um, and a lot of, like, mild repulsion, mm -hmm. I, w I would say. And part of it is obviously it's the title. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's like no one, you know, and I, it makes more sense to me now after I made the film. Like, yeah, of course, who wants to make a film called Thumbsucker? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, or I could see where some people would... Just, you don't want to talk about that. You don't right. do that. You don't need to say that word. You don't need to go there. You don't express it. And the, kind of what you're talking about, individuation, separation from mom, in some way, there's such kind of embarrassing, gooey things to this day. And I think that a lot of people could read my adaptation and go like, I smell mother issues. <laughs> I smell. Well, and, and, and you know, for the reason that, for the same reason that thumb sucking is a, is a, is a mortifying habit to have and is something that one would want to hide. I mean, you have to look pretty far afield nowadays for behaviors that actually, you know, make people uncomfortable. We right. think we're comfortable with everything from bondage to, right, right. Um, y you know, uh, whatever. But this is a genuinely uncomfortable Making, behavior. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I think it immediately brings out that side of everyone which they want to hide, which yeah. is the soft, gooey, um, uh, dependent, yeah. uh, unformed self. And, and self-soothing. And the self-soothing, It too. seems like as much as often talked about in Oprah-like bubbles, still incredibly... It's uh, astonishing how macho and respectable it is to go out and buy a 12-pack of beer, you know, and suck on the long neck beer for yeah. a guy who, you know, is, is supposedly masculine, and yet to have the thumb in the mouth is right. something that makes people want to cover their eyes, throw up, or, you know. Or run away from it. Or run yeah, away. Yeah, yeah. yeah, or call self-indulgent. Yeah, or call self-indulgent. Yeah. I love the idea that the most simple, really simple animal act of self soothing that you know comes to us instinctively is more repulsive than all these uh, outrageous consumption behaviors right. Right. that we that we indulge in right. there it's okay to it's okay to you know put yourself in a sports car and you know eat junk food all the time and drink a lot and smoke and so on but or, this little thing is yeah or, or even like to be outwardly cruel or violent Right. Would be way easier, way more fundable, <laughs> way sexier, more catchier. And somehow this... Oh, it's way catchier, yeah. Yeah. This, this is, is the, the opposite of violence. Yeah. It's, or it's sort of inward. Everything's going in. Mm -hmm. So funny how that's... It, oh, anyways, it really surprised me. I'm sure a lot of the resistance I had was just to the, to the bad parts of my adaptation or being a first-time director and like real legitimate things. But the sort of this common comment of it being soft... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Such a funny, and that was like, um, that meant you, the meeting's over, you can leave the room now. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And I kind of learned that over time. And, and I kept asking everybody, what does this soft comment mean? And people had different descriptions, but I, th I 
think a part of it is like what we're talking about. Like, like even if someone personally didn't disagree with that, they didn't want to invest money into that problem right. <laughs> that we have. You right. know what I mean? It's right. like not a good place to make a bank loan. Well, and I've got to say that when, you know, I, who wrote the book and, and imagined the scenes mentally, sat in a theater and saw Lou Pucci with his thumb in his mouth within a few seconds of the lights going down, it pushed me back in my chair. Right, right. It's something that I had not seen. Yeah, yeah. It was an image I had not seen. Yeah. And a feeling that I had not had. Yeah. And it's funny, I didn't, you know, I have mixed feelings about how I handled this thumb sucking because I, I purposely kind of kept it from far away because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be sort of a, you know, uh, I didn't want to sort of indulge in, in grossness or in, right, a, in a way right. do sort of a more maybe a maybe a Todd Solon's way of like really making you push back in your seat. Right. And so in some ways I sort of treated it from afar or idealized it a little bit. You know what I mean? I think you made it natural. Which to the person yeah, which to, to the person who which to the person who has the habit it is. It's yeah. the most natural thing in the world. It's the reactions of the others that are Yeah, it's strange. Uh, that are strange. Yeah. Um, let me just one more thing on this Audrey thing. Um, so they're having the contest, and you're, it's in that section of the book. Um, I kind of believe that Audrey would lose the contest. One scene that I imagined from her dream date seemed bound to haunt me always. Johnson filling glasses in a champagne while Audrey applied mascara in a compact mirror. Whether this moment ever came to pass didn't matter now that I knew the truth. Audrey's life with us was a compromise, a sham. Uh, I love just how many issues are like packed into that, and mm -hmm. like another way you describe Audrey is she's as beautiful as any woman in a magazine, mm -hmm. and the constant the way that Justin's looking through the media back at his life, mm -hmm. to so many different media characters and the whole kind of Reagan era thing that's going on right. in the novel, which isn't at all going on in, in my adaptation, um, but also this idea that I stuck to very much in my adaptation of. Justin trying to figure out how legitimate Audrey and Mike's relationship is. Mm -hmm. And like in the dressing room scene and, and even in the garage scene with Mike, he's, mm -hmm. he's trying to like get to the bottom of their relationship. Right, right. Um, and, and is worried that it's a compromise and a sham. And that was just, uh, these are all things that like, it's funny for me to, it's, it's been a really strange experience for me to have so much personal transference and such a personal cathartic experience with your life story. It's, it's like been, wearing your mask. It's been a very strange experience for me to have any reader of the book, let alone one who becomes a director of a film version, be that uh, understanding and empathetic about its themes. Because I thought I was writing a very peculiar story that right. I didn't necessarily think would ever be published, let alone... Really? Yeah. Why not? For the same reasons, I think that you had difficulty getting the movie made. Uh -huh. People read it and just had a kind of got the willies. <laughs> you, you, you know, um, uh, they before the book came out, Tom Wolfe, the writer Tom Wolfe, wrote a or, or spoke to a magazine or something about how repulsive he found the whole concept that thumb sucking was a metaphor for the sort of inwardness and silliness and. Uh, infantilism of uh, of the arts and of writing and and, and uh, you know thumb sucker is is actually a term in journalism for a uh, article that's written by someone who just sort of sits on the couch and comes up with it out of their own head you uh -huh. know, that's a real thumb sucker they'll say of a newspaper article or something I never heard that yeah and and so I think, like you say, it seemed like the story of a self-indulgent person uh -huh. and not someone who anyone would model themselves on or want to be or or even or or conversely be frightened by. Right. I, I, I there was something about the material that made people instinctively wary, uncomfortable, right. or angry. Right. 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 And, uh, and 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 it I think went through seventeen uh, publishers before it was published. I, I should mean. have known this before. I yeah, this I, I could have told you. <laughs> I could have told you. Um, I think, it, and obviously that's all made more hot by the fact that it's a young straight man. Yes, you know, yes. which really is exactly where it shouldn't be in these cultural. I know codes. 
Well, you know, if he'd come out as gay in, in the book or uh -huh. at the end of the story, I think it would have sort of fit someone's idea of right. uh, 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 of, a, uh, of this kind of story better. But that he doesn't, I think, makes people uncomfortable too. Yeah. Though I've got to say the book had a huge gay audience who I think saw in his embarrassment and difficulty over his thumb sucking a metaphor for uh, hiding their own right. selves. Right, right. I, I got interviewed by a couple, um, you know, out journalists mm -hmm. who are really interested in Justin, especially because he's surrounded by all these men men in mm -hmm. the movie. Keanu Reeves, Vince Vaughn, Vincent D'Onofrio. And he's the only, and even the little brother played by Chase Ofer, he's kind of like a man-man. Right, and doing his karate exercises. Yeah, and just sort of not, not self-reflexive. Right. Which we'll, which we call feminine term. Right. You know what I mean? And there's Justin, slightly long-haired, mm -hmm. you know, slightly Lou Pucci, slightly effeminate right. looking. And, uh, and I've had many people comment on how, what an interesting mode of being man he is. Mm -hmm. That you don't really see that much, especially in young guys. And the fact that he is straight is this so kind of makes it all the more complicated and kind of a, I guess it's like an emo guy that's very popular now and sort of in like alternative different right. cultures. But but um, th they took special interest in him as like the, the feminine male counterpart to all these six foot five big men right. that are in the movie. Right. And sort of did did really like him for that reason as being ho holding a space that you don't usually see guys hold. Well, you know, uh, I, that that's true. By the word, that word emo, I learned in reading reviews of Thumbsucker. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's obviously a big word in music and yeah, so yeah. on right now, but I'm a little out of it living where I do in Montana. But, um, but you know, I, I was, when I, when, I, when I visited the set and I saw the cast uh, physically, I, I loved it because they did seem to exaggerate the difference between Justin and the men around him. I mean, here you had Lou, small, delicately boned guy, and these giant men, yeah, yeah. dark men yeah. around him. And yeah. I thought, you know, if you were going to have a dream yeah. and, and sort of pump up and the, the, the contrast, this was how it would be. Yeah. Well, when, when it, when, the idea of, okay, Lou and Vincent D'Onofrio as a father-son relationship just physically does kind of state so many things between Mike and Justin in the book. And I, I've got to say, like DNA-wise, to be completely candid, DNA-wise, the, 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 the true uh, pair of people behind this book, myself and my own father, uh, if you ever saw a picture of us together, you uh -huh. would not believe the resemblance to the <laughs> casting you did. You would not believe it. It's funny. Well, it's funny. I think I think so much of your, because because this is coming from a real place and real experiences, and it's kind of in the DNA of the book. I think that kind of just went magically through the whole project. There were so many weird sort of familial um, um, coincidences that kept happening with the casting, or like the fact that how Tilda and and Lou, how Audrey and Justin ended mm -hmm. up looking so much alike. Mm -hmm by contacts and dyeing Lou's hair and parting on the same side, all of a sudden they really did mm -hmm. sort of transform. And and Lou really did confuse Tilda with his mother a lot. He would call Tilda Audrey for a year after we shot. And Tilda finally had to say to him in joking, you know, Lou, you realize I'm not your mother, you know? <laughs> she finally had to sit him down. <laughs> well, several, many times, because it, it became a joke between them. and. Um, but it, it, I think that whole kind of family thing that's like very alive in this kind of infected everybody that worked on it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and the relationship between the younger brother and, and Lou was very much exactly like it is on screen right. and in the book. Right. And, um, and, and um, Audrey and Mike and Tilda and Vincent are very much... I think that Audrey and Mike, while they feel an equal, or that like, that's your fear, or that's mm -hmm. Mike's fear, they actually are pretty good matches for each other. Right. And same thing with Vincent and and Tilda in the in the shooting of the film. Right. So all these echoes, I feel like, kept bouncing around everywhere. The whole idea of casting a family just fascinates me. Because, yeah. Because families obviously arise pretty much organically and not by choice. Yeah. Um, generally, and you know, putting together something that is as 
a complex and organic unit as a family and trying to simulate it. I don't know that I don't know that you can do that consciously. It almost has to happen through coincidence and yeah. and, and sort of affinity and uh, mysterious processes. Because if you just try to do it in your head or set them out like chess pieces and yeah. through you know try to make a genetic unit that has the right resemblances and so on, I don't know that you can. I think you, right. when you, to have a real family that really plays real is a very mysterious accomplishment that I don't think can be done by the rational. Yeah, and I think one of the more, um, in, you know, we had this two weeks of rehearsals which we did mostly improvising backgrounds and like improvising the parents' parents and mm -hmm. improvising when when Mike and Audrey first met and trying to try to give them history, you know, mm -hmm. like lived history. One of the best things I did, which was like totally idealist, was got them all into that house. Mm -hmm. And once we finally got the house and everybody was there, we went there one morning, everybody went to bed in their certain beds, and some of them actually went to sleep, you know? Mm -hmm. And they all just woke up when they felt like waking up, went to the bathroom, they did everything but take a shower, all on their own timing without me doing anything, all kind of bumped into each other at different points in the hallway, and then all came into the kitchen. And we did that like three or four times. And I, I swear it's like unintellectual and unbrain thinking that is, it gave them the most history together. Right. Right. And all of a sudden, they, they really acted very differently as soon as we did that. Are actors usually willing to perform these, exor these yeah, extended they're, exercises? They were really, really into it. And especially those, that group was super excited and felt very relieved in that we weren't just doing the script. And uh -huh. that, um, I mean, the weirder ones I did, Vincent wasn't there yet, and there was Audrey and, and, and Tilda Swinton and Lou Pucci, and so I'm just doing everything I can with the two of them, and one was, okay, Tilda, you're Justin, and you're sucking your thumb, and Lou, you have to be the father that's going to, or the mother, actually, that's going to scold him out of it and, and get him to stop, so they both felt each other's sort of guilt and weight, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And they looked at me totally freaked out, and, I, and we did it, and we kept bouncing back and forth, making one be first the child sucking his thumb, and then the adult trying to get him to stop, and we kept flipping, and it really had a remarkable effect on them. They both like felt the weight and felt like the the um, how they were tied together, the two of them in that mm -hmm. relationship. Well, you know, uh, it's my theory that families spend as much time a family member spends as much time being his or herself as they do imagining being all the other ones. Yeah, yeah. You know, a, a family is a hall of mirrors to a certain extent. Everybody's not just acting out his or her own fate. They're also attempting to imagine and inhabit the fates of the other people, especially whichever character in the family they're closest to. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, when this w would be described as a coming of age story, or uh, I would often resent it because I thought, no, this is the story of an organism. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this family organism, especially the way we run families in America, where we, we, you know, we cramp them together in one house, sort of cut them off from the neighbors and the extended family, right. and, and let them float like four or five refugees in, yeah. a, in, in, in a lifeboat, really does cause people to sort of merge and reflect each other and take on each other's burdens and trade traits and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, was what I tried to create in the book, was yeah. a sense of that. Yeah, yeah. That's what I so, so, and I'm very curious talking to you because um, having lived through so many things doing adapting your book yeah. and, and having it be over six years and having all these tumultuous things happen in my life, I wonder for you how it was a transformative experience to, to from when you started it. From starting writing to seeing the film? Yeah, or, and also just finishing the book, first of all, and then, yeah, I guess seeing the film. Well, the book was a strange book to write. I mean, it, I wrote it sort of as short stories, really as standalone, almost, short stories that were strung out along this boy's progression through the years. And then... I noticed that there were certain characters in these stories that I liked more than others. There were probably twice as many episodes in the first draft as there are in the final book. Right. And, 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 and I kind of had to find the theme right. uh, in a way, and I had to structure it in a way that made it into a, a big narrative. So when I finally had a book, it was as much a work of 
uh, leaving stuff out as right. uh, as of getting it done. It's different than any other book I've written. I, I write them beginning to end usually. This was like a collage, really. Right. And in a strange way, it didn't f ever feel finished. I could have put this one in and taken that one out, mm -hmm. but I let go of it and let it let it be published and so on. Now, when I started her hearing rumors that someone was interested in it as a as a film story, I couldn't imagine, first of all, what aspect of the story they were right, interested right. in because there were so many parts. But for me, uh, taking this very private behavior, it's almost poetic justice that it is the one book of mine that became a film. <laughs> because, because here was this behavior which I personally tried to hide, and which I then wrote about in an attempt to sort of exorcise or understand or, or get above. Right. And which then I get to see finally portrayed on the big screen with a family that's a surrogate family for mine and a surrogate family for the one I sort of reimagined for the novel. And so it was, in a sense, an outing yeah. personally on a grand scale. And uh, I found, though, that the feelings and the, and the, the doubts and the uh, complicated tensions that I'd had as a child that I thought I'd worked through in the book came over me afresh as I saw the film, <laughs> proving to me that, that proving to me that art does is not really transformative. Transformative or therapy. It is transformative, but it doesn't it doesn't cause you to escape your former self. Right. It allows you to confront it at different levels. Right, right. And and you get a chance to feel the same things over and over again from new angles and so on, right. but you don't get rid of them. You don't jettison them. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, that this book continued to live in me, and then to have a life after I, you know, sent it to the publisher, and continues to be a book that I think about is amazing to me because it really was probably the last thing I wanted to tell the world. Right, right. But in some ways, the only thing I had to tell them. And, right. and then it's not a story of war. It's not a big epic story. It's the story of a, a small American family without anything that crazily different about it, except that it shares all the sort of discomforts that we all do. And right. it has a lot of the, right. you know, problems. So, I, I mean, in hearing you say all that, I'm realizing that we're assuming everybody knows all the conversations we've had before, and this is has a lot of autobiographical things, and you did suck your thumb for all that time. So this is a real experience that you're talking about, not just a metaphor It's a real, a ex it's a real experience that's been filtered now a couple of times. Yeah. I filtered it by making it a novel. I edited it. I sort of found a meaning for it, mm -hmm. and then you took it up, and found your own meanings in it and 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 I feel like my first instinct when when we first talked and I first saw your response to the book was to let you have it right because I I, I thought if he's having anything it's gonna be genuine and intact uh, for him if I don't overly influence it, you know, right. and, and, and and just hearing you talk, I knew that you were on to something. I, I don't know that there's anything definitive about a book. Uh, you know, it, it just becomes kind of public uh, property mm -hmm. and you happen to find it and do something different than I would have. I, I couldn't have done anything with it as a movie. I, I wouldn't have known where to start, right. you know. Well, it's very funny what you said about that you feel like the book was this thing that didn't have to be locked down, or you could do a million versions of it, because yeah. the film became like, like that. And editing the film, I really feel like, and it took me you know, like a year after it was done editing to kind it of It seemed like it was kind of a down. wilderness yeah. from what I would hear that, yeah, you know. Yeah, it definitely was a wilderness. But it, it, there's something about it. Maybe it's something that's just in the DNA of the whole spirit of the thing again, where it felt very changeable and very mm -hmm. like, well, we can focus on this aspect. Maybe it's just because it's a story that has like many strands going through it, and many in different levels: like the parent story, the kid story, the family thing. The, there's different aspects of it, and so you can shift very easily. It's not a monolithic idea. Well, you know, w when when I started finding out how you 
who you were and how you were and knew your interest in music, I thought this is probably pretty good material for him because I think it can only be dealt with musically in uh -huh. a strange way. You, you know, you've, you've got these characters, these different instruments, and they can play together in all kinds of way. And I think ultimately it's, it's, it's a story that for me was edited musically. Right. You know, does this feel right next to this? Does it generally move right. from from this tone to that tone? But it, it was never a, a tightly plotted or yeah. you know lockstep progression toward anything. This story it was a series of notes and sounds and yeah. uh, that that you could put together. Yeah, that was one thing I so I I was skimming through it and preparing for this, and I was so envied so many moments that I didn't get to put in, you know, and mm. so many, uh, and I think, I think that's something that I envy about writing compared to filmmaking, and filmmaking is so monolithically driven, like someone's watching it in time, right. and it's hard to digress, it's hard to right. have modules and fall off the, the main beam, you know, right. and one of my favorite parts of Thumbsucker was all the digressions, or all the way that you can have things that seem way far off, and then they come back to the sort of main feeling of the book, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and that was definitely fed my filmmaking ideas. Like I remember the one of the first images is um, what would make Justin suck his thumb. And there's this great thing about um, Joel putting too much butter on his bread and the and the scallop teeth marks in mm -hmm. the in the butter. You mm -hmm. know, and little things like that were like the juice that was kind of turning me on all the way through. Mm -hmm. Like oh, how can I physicalize it as well as Walter did in certain parts. Mm -hmm. And it's also funny looking at it, how much of your dialogue is just straight in the film. Do you remember that? or? Well, I've got to say, to be completely vain and, and, and arrogant, when I would hear a little bit of patter or a few lines that were pretty much straight from the book, and I would be in an audience and it would laugh yeah, or yeah, respond, yeah. that gave me a rush. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think I probably know deep within me that I'm no screenwriter because I can't <laughs> discipline myself to make that straightforward story. Right. But, but to know at least that some of these lines were coming off for the real audience. Because, you know, is writing a book, you you're not there at the same time as your audience. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a real gift to see a movie that's true to the spirit where you get to be there at the same time, yeah. you know? Yeah, it's one of the few times, you, like for me doing graphic art and things that are in galleries and stuff like that, or even things that are on TV, you never get to sit with people and have it all at once. Yeah. You know, totally different experience. Yeah. I remember when you came, like that first time we met, and you came to my house, mm -hmm. and we are talking, and um, you ended up saying this, you're, it was the beginning of you being really generous to me. And maybe it's when like, you're describing that you thought it would be good to let me alone and, or let me have my own experience with this. Well, Which, I knew I knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you're, but I was stunned, and it was a really good technique, which you should remember, maybe, because, okay. because it was so clearly something that happened to you and this book that you wrote and these people that were of your life, yeah. you know what I mean? You're basically like, here, you know, take it. Right. And it instilled such responsibility in me. I was like, this guy's been too kind. I have right. to like, you know. And luckily, I feel like, I, I, I feel like everything I liked about the book and the stuff that I wanted to accentuate was in keeping, it seems like, with things that you were interested in. Right. Your sort of main themes. And anyways, you said to me, um, something like you, you get it. It's not about fixing yourself. It's about accepting yourself. And and you you kind of went into the small monologue that after you finished, I said, "Can I write that down, please?" And it became Keanu's last scene in the movie, uh -huh. where he's saying, "You know, we're all trying to fix ourselves. That's this human thing. Trying to find one answer that's going to be the the universal global answer that make us all better and like mm -hmm. cleaned up." Uh, but we can, we're all just guessing, no one knows exactly what we're doing at all, we're all in the dark, and what's so wrong with that, you know? Right. Which I basically wrote and put in the movie exactly, and um, felt very lucky that actually, and actually that clarified so much, because I was so in the middle of it. Right, Like right. you kind of came in like a teacher and said, here's your theme, <laughs> you know? Right, I mean? right. And, and helped me a lot in the, all the rewriting and the shooting and everything. But it was, it was like, only a theme that I discerned after I'd written the book. Right. But, you know, it was, and it, and it was also, when I thought about the experiences behind the book, the theme that emerged, because I spent, and I think a lot of people do, so much of my childhood and my teenage years 
trying to repair the person I was before the person had even emerged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it seems like we do that in this country. As soon as trends emerge in a growing personality, we're, all, we're trying to influence, correct, you know, um, edit, and so on. And nobody gets to just be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this was a story, I guess, whose moral for me was just be. And so I figured anything that happened with it, I should apply that moral to. Yeah. So let the director be. <laughs> let the movie be, you know. Um, that's in keeping with the spirit. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I think that's, maybe that's something I always find such relief in whenever anybody points that out to me. Because I, I think I live in that rigor a lot. Right. Of like, why aren't I... Why didn't I fix myself before? You know, right, right. And uh, it did become sort of the calling card for the whole way the film was made. You know, right. and my interaction with the actors and the crew, as much as possible, was very much like that. Like I remember with the actors, I was always like, "Fuck up." It's your first responsibility is to fuck up. Right. And then it'll give you permission to oh, try. Oh, we can swear on this thing. Great. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll be bleeped out. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, yeah, I've been editing myself. <laughs> but uh, anyways, I. I uh, I was. I felt very fortunate that you were that sort of generous with me, and then very fortunate that you pointed out where I was going in such sort of nice, experiential way. You know, mm -hmm. and it, and it all and it was so funny to me that it ended up being in the film. So in certain ways, my experience with you was transformed once again. As I am in the chair as Justin, and you're mm -hmm. walking around as Perry Lyman, sort of mm -hmm. explaining to me what happened in in the, my process of adapting the book, and then that sort of coming at the end of the film. Well, you know. Perry Lyman's an interesting character in the book because he starts out as the man with all the answers and ends up with the man as the man with none of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I, one thing I, I actually thought the movie did better than the book, to be honest, was show his character, it, you know, it, at its various stages of development from a guy who felt like he knew it all to a guy who knew he knew nothing. Yeah. Um, and that was a real delightful motif in the movie that I, I, I couldn't suggest as powerfully in the book, I don't think. Um, you know, you, you realize when you see a movie that really does attempt to, to sort of spiritually capture your book, what the limitations of writing are too. Like right. you, you, sa you said, oh, you know, I feel like film isn't a rich enough medium for some of these stories. Well, th there are a couple of things that I just wish I could do as a novelist. Right. One is put music to a, yeah. to a book. Yeah. I wish there was a microchip that could <laughs> ha be implanted in the pages that as you turn them gave it a soundtrack. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, I was able to have this whole experience with all my senses. Supposedly reading stimulates all the senses, but to be honest, I don't think it does. I, I think it's a pretty mental experience. And to have that real sensual experience mm -hmm. of colors, music, um, shapes, and so on was a revelation for me. Mm -hmm. a a and in all the choices that you made, I mean, you changed period, you changed the sort of cr time span, you, you condensed certain characters. The choices that were essentially right and that I responded to were the choices of, you know, the physical choices of setting, place, color, uh, composition, and so on. All of which, if I had been able to do the kind of thing you do, I might have made myself. Um, I, it, it, seeing the movie, in other words, was like a memory. It was like, it was mm. familiar. Um, it came from someplace that I was familiar with, but it was mysterious. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. How, how did you feel about the tone? Like the balancing of the humor and the more dramatic parts of the kind of... I mean, to me, it's a funny overall, I guess it's a sincere, it is a sincere movie, but it has different levels going on at the same mm -hmm. time. It's, your book is so complicated in that way to me, too. It's like your book is talking about real heavy stuff, often with a real light touch. Mm -hmm. and it, it's a little deceptive at first, and like 100 pages in, you're kind of like, whoa, okay. You know what I mean? This isn't as, as just funny as I thought it was, perhaps. Right, right. I, I, well, I thought that as far as the blend of humor and seriousness went, that the movie was pretty true to the book overall. Uh -huh. um, I, I felt like um, the sincerity of the film 
was a little more apparent than it exists in the novel as well, but I, I think it's not as apparent to people because there are some sort of bizarre mm -hmm. happenings and so on that, that that sort of sidetrack you in the novel from the from the overarching tone. But I actually found the tone to be remarkably similar, and and as evidence of that. I, are, are people's comments to me, oh, the movie was so much more serious than the book, some will say, or the movie was so much funnier than the book. Uh -huh. But averaging them all out, I realize that they, 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 they kind of meet in the middle. Funny. That's really funny. Now, reading it, I was kind of struck by, I think I wear my heart on my sleeve a little bit more. Maybe it's like... You do. For, yeah. First time writer, too. Like, my themes, like, when I get to a theme, I'm like, whoa. I'm gonna say right, it, you right? Know? And you're a little more deft. You're, and, you're, Mike, and you're one of the least well defended people <laughs> I've ever met um, outside of Minnesota. That you somehow managed to exist down here in Southern California is a, is a wonder of adaptation. I, I I don't know how meditation practice or what, but but you know. I, I would read interviews with you uh, <laughs> after it was made or see things about you, and I would go, this guy really has... I mean, you didn't suck your thumb. But I should have. Uh, no, but but sometimes I think the, the sincerity with which you went out to the press and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so on was a little... You may as well have just stuck your thumb <laughs> in your mouth because I think sometimes you got the reaction, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and I appreciated that. <laughs> I'm sorry, the hardest thing in this world right now is to be defenseless and, and, and not have a kind of complicated, ironic barrier between you right. and, and your audience and the critics and so on. And you don't. <laughs> and, 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 and my prediction is that, that that attitude will inescapably be infectious uh -huh. as more and more people see this movie, as they see it in their homes. I think this is a great movie to see in your house yeah. with your family. <laughs> it's kind of a creepy, yeah, actually, right. when you think about it. <laughs> well.